Good afternoon, welcome to Run Like Gaming. We're going to be doing another video. This is on a slightly older game from Fantasy Flight. Uh, this particular one is Talisman. Uh, this is the revised 4th edition, so it's a little bit older. And uh, it's pretty much a roll and move type game. Uh, and it, we're just going to go over the different components of the game and kind of explain how the gameplay itself plays. At the start of the game, uh, there's different ways uh, people can determine your character. Uh, but normally you're handed some of these character cards. Uh, some people might hand you one, two, or three, then you just choose between them. If you're doing one, you just take the one you get. Uh, but let's say we gave three to everybody. They would then go through and actually choose which character they are. So let's say in this case I have the choice between a, a monk here. Uh, there's a prophetess, and, yeah, prophetess and a thief. And each of these will have different effects on them as well. Uh, and they also have different starting attributes, so not all the characters are going to be necessarily equal as far as stats go. Uh, they, they start with different amounts of money, they start out with different abilities. But each character is going to have different benefits starting out. And like this one can start out with a warrior, a priest, or an assassin. And then this one drew the elf, the sorceress, or the troll. Let's go ahead and say that yeah. You know, let's go ahead and say that we are the gonna play the thief here. His ability. Well, first off, he starts out with three strength, three craft, four life, and two fate. And with this particular character, uh, you may take one gold or object of your choice from a character that you land on. So basically, he just goes around the board stealing stuff from people. Uh, on top of that, whenever you visit the market, market day, or village, you may take one card of your choice from the purchase deck for free. So basically he's just running around the board stealing stuff from people. Uh, so this might be like one card that I might choose. And then you're going to get these little uh, triangles here, and these kind of help determine your stats. Uh, basically get, it's really easy just to kind of stack them up to show what your current stats are. The Small triangles here are just one, whereas the other ones are just a little bit bigger. And you can kind of tell noticeably, like if you're looking at them, that one's a little bit larger than the other. Uh, the big one is worth five points, and then the little ones are worth one. And the three different colors here, the green is for life, so this is how much life you have. The red is for strength, so it's just how strong you are. And then the blue is for craft. Craft is kind of like a um, like magical ability. It would be the closest way to explain it. So let's say I grabbed the thief. This person over here grabbed the warrior. With the warrior, they are able to roll two dice whenever they attack. And they can also wield two weapons at once. Normally you can only wield one. Let's we'll go with that one. Then we'll just grab Let's see here. I'll just grab the troll. It's simple enough. And with the troll, uh, you do not have to roll at the crags, which is a location, unless you wish to. If you choose roll, you must accept the result. Uh, whenever you roll a 6 on your, for your move, you may regenerate instead of moving. If you choose regenerate, heal one life, and your turn immediately ends. So if I were to ever roll a 6 on a move, so like in this case it's just a 5, um, if I ever roll a 6, instead of actually moving, I can go ahead and heal one. So the troll can kind of regenerate over the course of the game, which isn't huge as far as abilities go, but he does have really good stats. So like he does have really good special abilities. The regeneration's okay, but it's by no means uh, game changing. But the difference is he starts out with six strength. So he starts out with quite a bit more. He starts out with one craft, so if you fought um, any kind of magic user, he's probably gonna get beat in a in that kind of fight. He also starts out with six life, which is huge stat wise. So Whereas, as I said, like the thief is three strength, three craft, and four life. So the troll's a little bit bigger as far as the stats go. 
Because if you go into a strength fight with a troll, for the most part, it's probably not going to end well. And then the warrior starts out with four strength, two craft, and five life, it looks like. But, alright, so that would be the characters. Normally I would hand out these triangles, uh, but I'm not going to mess with it necessarily. In this, but, as I said, you would hand out according to whatever their status on there. And then, afterwards, you would also give them fate. Fate are these uh, two-sided ones here. The, the bright side shows that you have fate available. When you use it, we usually just flip it over, just to show that you use it up. So let's say if you have two fate, I have two fate currently showing. If I use one, it'll flip over. What the fate is for is to help you mitigate rolls. So let's say if you had a really bad roll, you know, if you need something to three plus in a combat. I got the three, so I'm good. So let's say if I had a two, but I really need a three plus, I could use this fate to do a reroll. And in that case, I would have succeeded, but I no longer have the fate anymore, so. Uh, that, and fate can be used on pretty much any roll, just about. Uh, and you can do it for quite a bit of different stuff. So if you go to, like, the market somewhere, or, you know, there's some sort of roll on one of these locations, or one of these cards come up and you're fighting something, or if you're just moving, you really don't want to go to the spaces that are available, so maybe you use your fate to re-roll your move, which is fine too. And those are different options as far as what you could do as well. So once you have your characters, uh, at that point you would grab one of these uh, guys up center. They're nice, heavy, like plastic. And then you're going to go to the starting location that's annotated on your card. So like on your card itself, with the troll, he actually starts off at the crags. And it'll show you the location down here. And it'll also show you their alignment. And alignment only factors in certain locations and certain items. Like you cannot, uh, you cannot wield certain weapons unless you're good, or you can't wield certain other weapons unless you're evil. But this particular one is neutral. And he starts out at the crags. So we'll go send him there. The thief here, he starts out at the city. The city is over there. And then we have our warrior. The warrior starts out at the tavern. Now normally um, you wouldn't have all the stuff in the center here, but as in, for demonstration purposes, we're just throwing everything in the center here. The object of the game itself is to get to the the tower here, uh, which allows you to do the command spell. And the command spell basically does one point of damage to everyone on the board, and then just be the last one to survive once someone arrives here. Uh, some people just call it early, just depending on, because it can run kind of lengthy, but as I said, your goal is basically to go from this outer tier to this middle tier, eventually get into this inner tier, and make it over here, which then brings you into the command. Once you get into command, then at that point you slowly start killing everybody. At that point, whenever the command is initiated, it's going to be the last one alive at that point. So, Alright, so that is uh, the starting people here. And then... You have some other character cards which do look a little bit different, but these are toad cards. And you can see because they're green bordered, whereas your character sheets, they're red bordered. The green borders are just effects that sometimes happen where you can get toaded. Uh, in this case, you are now a slimy toad for three turns. Leave all your objects, followers, and gold on the space where you uh, turn into a toad. While you are toad, you have one strength, one craft. You move one space per turn, you don't roll for those. Uh, you retain your life, so you keep your life on there. You keep your fate. You cannot add the additional strength and craft points to your character. You cannot cast or gain spells. Uh, though you may keep the ones you had. When you return to normal, the character will be as before. Minus objects, followers, gold, fate, lives, loss, while a toad. So, as I said, the toad himself is kind of like a downside. Sometimes it occurs to where uh, something turns you into a toad for some reason. Sometimes there's spells that do it, and sometimes there's a few locations that do it. 
So, at this point, each player is going to, well first you'll determine who the first player is, and you can determine that, however, usually you just have a roll off, whoever has the highest roll will go first. So let's say, the thief moved one, so he's going to move here. At this point you're going to do whatever the ability on the card says, in this case it just says draw one card, so we're going to draw one card from the top of the deck. And then we're going to do whatever effect it has. In this particular case, this is a enemy, and it is an animal. What it is is a wild boar. It has a strength of one. What we're going to do now is that one person will roll for the boar. One person is going to roll for the thief. Well, the thief is going to roll for himself. But let's say the thief rolled. He got a five. The boar rolled, and he got a four. The boar is going to add his one strength to his roll, so right now he's at a 5. The thief is going to roll, add his strength to this roll as well, which is plus 3. He will be at an 8. This means that the thief won, the wild boar is vanquished, you now take the boar as part of your collection. Now why the collection is good is that once you have 7 points worth of one stat, either craft or strength, you can turn those in to get a permanent stat boost. So you, what you're doing is you're killing monsters in order to get effectively experience, and then the ex experience can be used to turn in for stats. So let's say if I kill six more boars, I'll have seven strength total. Once I have seven strength, I can turn in all those cards, and I get an additional strength. So instead of being at three strength, I'll be at four. And then I'll make a lot of your combat and stuff like that a little bit easier to win as well. Now at this point, the troll will be the next person to go. And apparently I rolled terribly, so he's also going to move one. He's going to move this way. Now again, you take one off of the adventure deck here. Now this one is an ogre, so he's going to be fighting an ogre. And the ogre itself is strength five. Now luckily, the trolls are already strength six, so he does have a little bit of an advantage. So we're going to go ahead and roll for the troll here. He rolled a four. Four plus six is ten. The ogre is now going to roll, and he has a five. In this case, it's five plus five equals ten, and four plus six equals ten. Now the troll has a few options here, because if they leave this battle alone completely, and go with these results of a tie, the tie is going to go to a stalemate. A stalemate but pretty much means that this card here is going to stay on the square. Whoever comes in the square next is going to have to encounter that. Or, he could spend some fate. If he wants to spend his fate, he could do a reroll. However, he needs a 5 or a 6 to win this fight. So let's say he did fate. Obviously it's not. There's a good chance he could lose this by doing that. So he rolled a 4. So in this case, he just kind of wasted his fate for nothing, which it does happen sometimes. So in this case, it'll be a stalemate. This card will now be in the square, and neither of them hurt each other. So Next, we're going to do the warrior. He's going to move two. He, uh, this also says draw one card, so at which point you will draw a card. Now, in this case, it's a follower. Followers, you can have any number of them, and they grant you additional abilities. In this case, uh, you need not roll a die in the force unless you wish to. If you choose to roll, you must accept the result. You may evade characters and creatures and characters in the woods. So if you're at the woods and someone were to go there to attack you, or if you were to reveal the, uh, a creature card there, you can evade the creature if you don't want to fight it. So it's beneficial and can be useful in different circumstances. Now this is going to keep going on and on and on, and what you're effectively doing on the outer ring here is trying to build up your stats. You're trying to get them up high enough to kind of move further into the, the inner ring here. The easy way to get from the outer ring to the inner ring is going through the sentinel. Now the thing about the sentinel is though, he has 9 strength. So if you were to try to go up this way and declare that, hey, I'm going to try to go up the bridge, then you have to fight the sentinel. Now, 
again, since he has 9 strength, it may not be very easy to fight him unless you have some higher stats. So let's say the troll. The troll has 6 strength currently, so I'm going to roll for the troll. Luckily I rolled a 6, so right now he's out of 12. So 6 strength plus 6 roll. And then the sentinel, he rolled a 3. So 3 plus 9 is a 12. So even with this roll, you still did a stand off, you know, a standstill. So it's not the best particular circumstance. So unless he raises the stats a little bit, it might be a little difficult to go up there. Uh, but it is still feasible to do so. But that's one way. Another way is sometimes you can buy items, or sometimes there'll be events that pop up. But let's say if you went to the market. You could buy Yeah. So let's say you wanted to acquire a axe. So as an example, you can go ahead and go through there and pick up an axe. It has an additional ability. You may build a raft when you are in the woods or the forest. So if you are in the forest or the woods, there's also a woods over here. And there's also a woods over here. So there's a couple of spots where this is applicable. So you could actually land on any of those spaces and build a raft. Now if you build a raft, you will get a card that says raft on it, of course. On your next turn, instead of your normal move, you may choose to cross the river to a space directly opposite of the one you are in. Uh, whether you choose or not, whether you cross or not, place the raft on the discard pile uh, as it cannot be carried with you. So you cannot carry the raft with you. But if you spend the time to actually build the raft, you can go across the river here. So this is another option so you don't have to actually go through the sentinel. So let's say if you are like a wizard, you don't have a lot of strength to begin with usually. So going this way with craft is hard to do. So that's an option as well. Um, also, some of the locations as well, and some of the events can kind of push you to the inner ring as well, or the middle ring here. So that's another option. And the market's pretty easy to get to, because when you go to the market, you get to choose what item you want to buy. So let's say if you want to buy an axe, then, you know, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, so that is pretty much how the outside plays for the most part. Uh, as I said, you just read the instructions on the card. You know, for example, if you go to the village here, you have a couple options to choose from. Either you can go to the Mystic, where you roll a dice and something occurs, and it has all the options there. You can go to the Healer, which can heal you for money. Or you can go to the Blacksmith, and buy a helmet for two gold, or a sword for two gold, or an axe for three gold a shield for 3 gold, or an armor for 4 gold. And these are all different, they all have different benefits. If you were to go here, you can kind of look over the cards to see which one might be more beneficial to you at the time. Um, and now, next thing we're going to go over are the spells. Now, the spells are kind of conditional. Uh, you can only use them during certain times, or they give you certain effects. Like, um, for example, Acquisition. Uh, start Cast at the start of your turn. Before you move, take one object of your choice uh, or one gold from any character. So this, you could just steal something from someone else at the table. Uh, teleport. Cast on yourself instead of rolling the die for movement. Teleport to any other space in the same region. So you can go anywhere in the outer ring if you're in the outer ring. If you're somewhere in the center already, you can move to anywhere in the center. Uh, you cannot cast a spell in the inner ring, because it does specify you cannot use it here, in the inside portion. Uh, healing. Cast as required. By casting it on yourself or any other character, the recipient is healed up to their uh, max life total. And there's going to be a lot of these spells, and they all have quite a bit of different effects. So, I mean, you can kind of go through it. Uh, as you're playing, there's a chance that you can draw spells. Sometimes uh, certain locations will give you spells. However, not everyone can wield spells. Is a little bit of a disadvantage about it. You have to have a high enough craft 
in order to actually uh, use spells for them is already so. So as an example, uh, you need at least three craft to actually ha obtain one spell. If you have four or five craft, that can give you up to two spells. If you have six craft or more, you can hold up to three spells. So as you're using spells, you know, you can only have up to a certain amount anyway. Like you, It's like your spellbook has a max limit, depending on how good you are at craft. Uh, but it does top off at three, so... Uh, and then as I mentioned, most of it is just reading the cards that you come across, or just interacting with um, the spaces intended. Like as I said, when you get to the inner ring, uh, well not the inner ring, but the middle ring, these can be a little bit more dangerous, which is why you may not want to run up here as soon as you can, but it does have certain benefits, but it also has certain disadvantages. For example, Hidden Valley here, you draw three cards instead of one. So you might interact with quite a bit of stuff, because let's say if I drew three adventure cards, uh, you're going to interact with each of these. In this case, it helped me out quite a bit. For example, I got a Maiden, she adds two to my craft, so she makes my craft a lot better. But she's a follower, so I get to keep her. A uh, mule, they allow me to carry an extra four items, because your max limit is four items normally. If I obtain a mule, I can carry four more items. So, and the fountain of wisdom. Place a total of four craft here when revealed. You may drink from the fountain once per visit and take one craft from the fountain to add it to your. So, Let's say if I were to have gotten this, you're going to put four of these craft triangles on the location. Now each time someone lands here, they can take one of these craft and add it to their supply. So it's a good way to just raise stats, and then if you come back here again, you'll interact with it again. So, And that's um, how the middle ring works here. However, there are some bad things as well. For example, the Black Knight, you either pay one gold or you lose a life. So if you land here, it could hurt you a bit. Uh, this location here, which are the ruins, uh, if you yeah, if you draw a creature card in here, uh, you add two to their attack, their attack roll. So let's say if they are a four strength, that effectively makes them a six strength at that point, uh, as far as you know, at this location. Now it only still counts as four as far as your trophies go, but it'll count as six when you're at this location here as far as the attack goes. And a lot of these do damage and stuff, like um, the desert here. Uh, you lose one life, draw a card. There's another desert here. You lose a life, draw a card. And that's why the, the middle portion here is a little bit more dangerous. Whereas the outer ring, there's only like two that actually do anything bad to you, two or three. Whereas the rest of it's just draw a card. So it's a little bit easier to deal with than the inner ring here. Once you get to the, the inside, well the much more inside ring here, you have to go through the portal of power. So first you land here, and then you try to open up the portal of power. Uh, basically, what you're going to do is you're going to uh, do a roll. So you do not draw a card if there is a plane of peril. Uh, if there's already one of, uh, in this space. If you're crossing to the plane of peril, which is this space, uh, do not draw a card. Instead, you must first use craft to pick the lock or strength to force it. Choose which ability you are using and roll two dice. If the total is equal to or less than, your chosen ability. Move to the plane of peril. If it is higher, uh, remain here and lose one from that ability. So let's say if I have eight strength and I want to try to break through with strength. I roll 2d6 and I roll a three, so I'll be good. And when I do that, I'll go to the plane of peril. When in the plane of peril, you only move one space per round. So either you're going to go this way, or you're going to go this way. And it has different um, abilities and attributes. 
So you might want to go this way depending on your uh, stats, or you may want to go this way depending on your stats. You can kind of read each of the things of which you could run into. But as you uh, go further, you'll eventually end up at this location here, which is the Valley of Fire. Once at the Valley of Fire, you must have a talisman to enter. Uh, you can only enter if you have a talisman. If you do not have one, you must turn back. The Crown of Command can only be reached from this space. So like in this particular case, um, if you're trying to get up to the, the tower here for the command, you're going to need a talisman to do that. And the talisman can be gained from a few different places. Sometimes you can do it from here. There's a quest location here. And there's different places where it can be acquired at. So it's definitely possible to get it obtained at some point. But if for some reason you went up this way and you lost it, then at that point you're just kind of stuck because you can't really, you know, go up to the tower itself. So... Yeah, so in this case, if you do not have one, you must turn back. So at this point, you know, you'd have to go somewhere else for that. And then this is going to keep going over and over and over until eventually someone gets up here and then kills everybody else at the table. And that's pretty much the game of Talisman. It does uh, vary quite a bit depending on uh, which roles are currently played. Uh, there are a lot of different event cards. You know, you might come across bandits, uh, you might obtain gold. There's a book of spells, which is an event. You have found the fabled book of spells. You gain your full complement of spells according to your current craft. The book then vanquishes to the discard pile. So you'll have different events like that occur. You have things like guides, and as I mentioned, there's some talismans in here. In this case, you have the Holy Grail. No evil character may have the Holy Grail. You add one to your craft. You do not lose a life in the desert. So as long as you have the Holy Grail, these deserts will not hurt you, which is really kind of beneficial. So uh, The Potion of Strength is um, a usable item. When you drink the Potion of Strength, uh, you increase your strength by two until in a turn. Uh, once you once you do drink it, you discard it though. So this is something that maybe there's a fight that's coming up. You might need that to kind of help uh, benefit yourself a little bit. And there's quite a bit of items in here. Uh, some of them are really, really beneficial. Some of them not as much. Uh, some of them are monsters. Sometimes they're followers. There's quite a bit of different things. Uh, one other thing I was going to go over, because I haven't mentioned it, is you can also go after each other as well. So let's say if the thief here rolled a 3. Now obviously he's going to use his ability first. You may take one gold object of your choice from a character that you land on. So since he landed here, I could steal a gold from him or an object. So I can just take it from him and just run away. At this point I can fight him with strength. Now certain characters it'll say you can uh, fight something instead with your craft. So like wizards for example will fight based on their craft. So if I attack you as, with my wizard and you have a warrior, we're actually going to use craft instead of strength. Which is really beneficial in some cases because like the warrior for example has two craft but four strength. So he's really strong but he's not very good with craft. So just to give you an idea the sorceress is kind of the opposite of the warrior in that she has two strengths and four craft. So let's say the warrior landed on the sorceress. The warrior's going to probably be able to beat her through strength, most likely. And of course, dice rolls can change things. But if she were to land on him, she could use craft on him instead. So those would be different factors as far as um, how these different characters here. But yeah, like, uh, what they'll have is they'll have a specific... Um, statement on here. When you attack another character, you may choose to make a, uh, make an attack psychic combat. Uh, you may not do this when you are attacked by another character. 
So if you make it a psychic attack, it'll be um, craft four instead, instead of the uh, strength attack. So it's that it's kind of like a like an RPG meets Monopoly sort of in a way. You're kind of building up your character. You're trying to increase your stats. You're trying to expand your character out a little bit, make them a little bit stronger. And then once you do that, you kind of want to move towards the higher level area. And then once you kind of got yourself set up well enough, you want to get into the inner ring here, get to the command tower, and then just wipe everybody out. Once you do that, you win the game. Now with uh, expansions, because there are expansions for this game, they do have replacement things. I believe there is a dragon in one where you can actually replace it to where you're trying to get up to a dragon and find a dragon. And I think it's like whoever beats a dragon and wins the game. So instead of going through the whole command thing. Uh, basically the command, all that does is every round instead of moving, you roll a dice and then there's a certain chance that the command will trigger. If the command triggers, it'll do one point of damage to everybody at the table. If it does not trigger, then that pretty much is your turn anyway. So at that point, everybody else moves. It goes back to command again. You roll. Did the command go off? It did. Each player then takes the damage. Uh, there's sometimes ways of mitigating that damage. But let's say you took the damage. You're going to keep taking that damage until you get to the center here and kill the person in the center. So if you can't make it there in time, then they may just beat you you know, before you can make it there. If you do make it up here, and someone's already in there, then it goes to combat back and forth until one of you die. So, yeah, so that's the game of Talisman. Uh, I hope I explained everything well enough. Uh, but we're definitely going to have more videos in the future. Uh, if you like this video, definitely like and subscribe. Uh, if you have any feedback on the video itself, I'll definitely post that as well. Uh, otherwise, thank you for watching Run Like Gaming, and you have a good day.